Hi, I'm Kelly Cervantes, and this is Seizing Life, a bi-weekly podcast produced by Cure Epilepsy. Today, I'm happy to welcome Kate Kostolansky to the podcast. Kate's daughter, Charlotte, was diagnosed with infantile spasms just before her second birthday, which is a late onset for IS. Kate is here today to share Charlotte's journey and progress and to tell us about a children's book she was inspired to write. Kate, thank you so much for joining us today. I would love to hear about your daughter, Charlotte. What does she like? How old is she? Um, give us give us the Charlotte rundown. Yeah. Um, well, thanks for having me. And um, so Charlotte is our first baby. She is, oh, she is just all of the things. She is happy. She is silly. Um she has quite a flair for dramatic so we (laughs) joke that she's going to be a great actress one day um but she has such a lovable and big energy about her she just is so so happy and how old is she now she just turned three she turned three in june um and she we just celebrated her little brother teddy's first birthday this past week Oh my goodness, a big yeah. sister. I love it. Yes, a bossy big sister for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I know a thing or two about that being a bossy big sister. So tell me a little bit about Charlotte's journey with epilepsy and what sort of tipped you off that something wasn't quite right? Because it's really only been within this last year that you've been navigating this. Yeah. Um So Charlotte developed normally um, until she was two Um, and right around that time, it was right before her second birthday, we noticed her doing this strange, it kind of looked like a startle reflex. Um, Her arms would go up and there was something just unsettling about it to me that it seemed involuntary, Um, but it would last only a few seconds and then she'd be perfectly fine. So I took a video of it and I brought it up at her second um, year well check with her pediatrician and she actually did it in the room um, with the pediatrician, did that same thing. Um, And the pediatrician reassured us that, you know, she's met all of her milestones and um, she wasn't concerned with the movement and um, of course, that's what I wanted to hear. So that was kind of reassuring. Um, And then I went home and she still was doing it. It was usually after nap time, um, but it still just didn't sit right with me. So I called back and I was that annoying mom and asked if she could give me a referral to a pediatric neurologist. just for peace of mind. Um, and she was wonderful and said, of course, and and thought very much that it was um, going to just be for peace of mind. And the irony now um, <laughs> is is that it wasn't, but that was the, the first interaction that we had kind of thinking something was off. So it, you said that she was developing normally up to this point. How long did it take you to get in to see the pediatric neurologist? Yeah, so I called right away and and he was great. Um, We did a talk over the phone um, and I'm so thankful that he was, most places you don't talk to the doctor, Um, you talk to somebody scheduling. And because we're in a small town in New Hampshire, um, he actually talked to me. he said to send over some videos um and then he got us in pretty quickly and as soon as he saw the the videos he he thought infantile spasms it's so counterintuitive because you see this small movement and you come to later realize what the um serious implications are but at the time it all felt very dramatic um like sure i wanted to look into this but um the neurologist went from looking at the video to scheduling an eeg and telling us that um if it was confirmed um 
you know, all of the things that lie ahead that felt like a very stark contrast to the reassurance we had just received. So that was really our our first interaction with any sort of understanding of what this this was. Now, what were you told about infantile spasms and, and were you given any ideas of prognosis? When my daughter was diagnosed with infantile spasms, I had certainly never heard of it before. So the first thing I do, of course, is Google it. And then it's, it's terrifying and as it should be. Um, and it, you know, thankfully you're the neurologist that you saw took it seriously because it is an emergency, but it does. You're right. It is such, it's these small movements and it's so hard to reconcile that with the emergency and the potential damage that it is. So I wonder, you know, what were you told, um, along the way as, as you were navigating this in the early days? Yeah. Um, and like you said, it's a hard balance because, you go online and he told us, don't Google this. And of course you do because you don't know anything. <laughs> um, and I hadn't heard of it. And she's our first baby. We took every class under the sun, you know, read all the books. So we Googled it and it does. The prognosis is horrible. It's so terrifying. And it just like you said, it's that balance of, yeah, it is that urgent. Um, but at the same time, there's only very negative and there it's mostly outdated information that we found so um there weren't great resources um until we really were um at a care team i think um when we went to boston children's and that was the first time that i felt like we kind of had a a team in place that was looking at that now, I want to touch on something else um, because Charlotte was two when she started exhibiting signs for infantile spasms, which is very late. Typically, infantile spasms shows within the first year, even within, you know, six to nine months, three to nine months is really um, when it presents the most. So, you know, I, Adelaide, my daughter had infantile spasms Would we would get rid of it and then it would come back and it would come back. And the last time it came back, she was over two years old and we had a hard time getting medication because the indication for IS is only up to two years old. So talk to us about that and any of the challenges that you faced or what you were told because she was two, which, which really is late uh, for it to show up. Yeah. Um, and, you know, IS is rare. Um, it's three in 10,000. And 90% of those are within the first year the children are diagnosed. So we were looking at, you know, epilepsy, as you know, all too well, it's not linear, it doesn't make sense. And it is frustrating. So we were the lucky and unlucky in that she was in a smaller percentage of an already small um, number. And on one hand, that made it really hard to find um, when there's already not a lot of information and in data and um, all the statistics that you want as a parent, that was lacking, you know, enormously for her. So, um, she was 23 months at onset and that's why they were able to um you know still consider it but all of those same things that it was confusing even for pharmacists you know filling her prescriptions because she was older than most so it does happen um but it, there aren't that many um cases and then when there's a better prognosis, um, maybe they've met milestones. Um, it's crazy. I've talked to so many moms that then their their kids aren't followed because they end up doing well or getting spasms under control. And so there is just such a lack of data and statistics around infantile spasms in general. Um, it's yeah. just, yeah, not enough. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. 
Hi, this is Brandon from Cure Epilepsy. Have you or a loved one been recently diagnosed with epilepsy? Are you looking for more information about epilepsy and available treatment options? Go to cureepilepsy.org forward slash four dash patients to get resources and information about epilepsy. Now back to Seizing Life. Now, you mentioned that you were able to get to Boston Children's where they were able to um, give you more uh, specialized treatment for the IS. What was the treatment that was prescribed initially? So we started with steroids. Um, And if you look at most websites, it tells you that ACTH is the first line treatment. And that's what we assumed we would start with. Um, And children's is kind of always at the forefront of, you know, the studies. And they actually found that um, prendicillone was a better option. And I mean, it's hard. You have to listen to the professionals. um, But that was that was awful. Um, That was heartbreaking to go through. We did two rounds of that. And that was um, that was really, really hard. So explain to people, because I I mean, the times that Adelaide was on steroids was probably like some of the worst of our of her life. Like it, it, it just explain what that's like. So people can understand what that means because they, you know, people hear steroids and they're yeah. like, they, they seem so commonplace. Like, you know, my husband is a singer. So sometimes he takes a steroid, you know, if his voice is feeling tired. Um, but these steroids are a little bit different and a big amount for little, little, people because like you said i was like oh steroids okay like we can do this and to watch what it steals from them um you know you have to believe in the the greater goal of it but as you're watching it it was definitely the the darkest times um it they're so exhausted they're so uncomfortable um it the way I describe it to people is Charlotte was a shell of who she is and it was heart wrenching as a parent. Um, and when we had to do it a second time, knowing how bad it was going to be was, was tough. The second time we added by Gabatrin and that was at first we were in the possible side effects with that, as it was explained to us, are possible vision loss. And, you know, you're hit with like a a truck of all of these things. And then there's potential vision loss um, with this experimental drug. And at first we, we didn't feel comfortable with that. And and then as it goes on and you see how much the spasms are stealing from them in a different way, you're like, I'll give them anything. And the they have to tell you those side effects, but it is so well managed. She saw an ophthalmologist so many times. And now I, you know, perspective is everything, but I wish we had done that from the beginning. And that has thankfully, um, knock on wood, cause I'm a little superstitious. Um, that was what ended up getting, um, spasm control for her. So that was the miracle combo. Yeah. And there's in a lot of recent studies, what they're showing is that combination, whether it's ACTH or prednisolone with Vigabatrin, the two of them together seems to provide uh, the best outcomes. But it is, it's scary. You're like talking about vision loss and you're putting your child on this, this steroid and they get all puffy and they don't even look like themselves anymore and they're crying. But the reverse of that, what, you know, the infantile spasms is, is taking these milestones away. It's taking their smiles and their personality. And, and, um, you know, if if it's not, if there isn't a regression, it's at least halting development. Did you see any regressions or stalled out development in Charlotte during that time? Yeah. So her being older, she was already walking and talking. And, you know, I thought that she was kind of speech delayed 
but I was, by all accounts at this point, a nervous first time mom that was wanting her to, you know, be at the beginning of every milestone on the AAP guidelines. And in hindsight, it really was the beginning of at least a plateau. Um, and I, I say to parents that I've talked to since that, you know, it's so hard once you start the medication because you had this you know, your, your baby that was smiling, laughing, doing all the things that you said, and then you start them on this medication for something that looks like not that serious, just a little spasm. And it feels so much worse. It feels like this is what's stopping their development. And this is what's halting everything. Um, and it's so much easier to say being on the other side, but because at the time we weren't making any progress um, and we did every the therapy, early intervention, everything under the sun. And you don't know if it's working, getting anywhere, doing anything because you're not seeing anything. Um, it was a complete pause of everything. And the only upside is if we hadn't gone through the treatment, then it would have been a regression and you don't know that um, until you're in it, but it's it's hard to, to make that jump to do it, but otherwise you're gonna, it's gonna be so much worse. Um, and that's terrifying. Yeah, absolutely. And so you mentioned that, you know, you did the first round of steroids and it didn't work or the seizures came back and then you did the second round with the Vigabitrin and that has worked. How is Charlotte doing today? So I'm, I'm knocking on wood here. I hate saying <laughs> any of that <laughs> stuff, but um, she is seizure free at the moment. Yeah. Um, how is she, how is she doing developmentally? A big old three-year-old yeah. now. Yeah. Um, so at three, um, early intervention ends and, you know, I'm sure, you know, there's a million appointments that you have, a million um, therapies, everything, and you kind of just are used to them. Um, and it was really sad when we were ending our early intervention because they're just so wonderful, everything they do. I have a whole new appreciation. It's it's so fascinating. And she was um, evaluated at age-appropriate um, development. And I don't know, we had been so going through the motions and it, like she had a few clear EEGs, which was a huge win. Um, and you kind of stop focusing on the development when you just want them to be back to healthy and happy and, you know, everything else just seems not as important. Um, so to get that was like, oh my gosh, that was something we we never thought that we would hear. And at the same time, I say that with a lot of compassion and my heart breaks that I know what it's like when you hear that and you're still seeing the spasms um, on your child and nothing's working. And, you know, we were close to failing two drugs. Um, and after that, you know, if you fail two, then you're presumed to, you know, continue to fail them. Um, and that is the reality for too many families. And it, it really only made me more passionate that this is something that no family should go through. Okay. You bring up something really um, important that certainly hits home for me. We never got control of Adelaide's spasms, but I think that stories like yours, like Charlotte's are so important because when families are researching infantile spasms, they find my family's story and it is tragic and horrible, but that is not everyone's story. And I want people to know that there is hope, that there is this world where it can't there are treatments that that can beat it and um and so I, which is why i think that that your story is is so important and that it needs to be shared because there are children who come out on the other side 
I do want to, and I know that you are aware of this. I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but any child that is diagnosed with infantile spasms, even if they are able to get rid of it, has a chance of a different type of seizure coming back or developing a different type of epilepsy. And so it is always something that you have to be aware of. While, you know, Charlotte is going to go on and, and lead this healthy, typical life, um, that potential epilepsy diagnosis is is going to be there. And so I, I sort of, I do want to emphasize that. You're never safe. You're no. never safe. And that, and that sucks, but I, I think it's one of the reasons that all of, for example, the, the infantile spasms research that CURE has been working on is so important because these treatments are not cures. They are treatments and they can get rid of the hip arrhythmia that comes with the infantile spasms, this bizarre brainwave pattern and the, the seizures, but they are not curing whatever caused them in the first place. And so while I am like ecstatic for you and your family and all and the hope that your story can bring to people, I do want to make sure that there is still an urgency that people feel that these that a more data and more information and more research is so desperately needed, which brings me to this incredible book that you've written, which I hope does just that and raises incredible awareness. Tell us about Char Bear Keeps Dancing. Yeah. So Charlotte being older, she was in preschool and we wanted to make sure that, especially since we didn't have spasm control yet, um, her teachers and the students were aware what to expect. And it started off as simple as that. I wrote it as a note in my phone. And um, then I I wanted to make sure it was medically accurate. Um, and so I shared it with her neurologist. And then they all started talking amongst themselves, the neurologists, um, that, you know, there's nothing like this out there. Um, anybody going through this, we're looking at all of the same resources and options that we were, which are not enough and it's terrifying. Um, epilepsy in general is misunderstood, but infantile spasms, you know, some people don't even make the connection that that is epilepsy. Um, so the book was kind of a way um, to have a resource for families. The hope is that families can get it at, you know, time of diagnosis because it's such a dark, dark time. Um, and it's really just um, supposed to be at a very basic level explaining infantile spasms and going to the doctor and how it's not scary and, you know, kind of just a basic explanation for siblings. Um, you know, grandparents, aunts, uncles, teachers, that is kind of an easy rundown of a very complicated and and hard thing. And we're hopeful that um, because this doesn't apply to everybody, and it is really rare, um, we don't want it to just sit on the shelf. And there's a, a lot of um, hospitals that are, you know, under-resourced and don't have the ability to um, get the books for their patients. And we're, we're hoping that one day um, we can have every patient that's diagnosed um, leave with a book, which would be cool. That would be absolutely amazing. I can't wait to purchase my copy. Where can people get the book and when is it available? Yeah. So it's going to be in three versions, um, English, Spanish, and French. All three of those are going to be on um, Amazon. And we are um, doing some larger orders, um, like five packs for families, or um, some people have expressed interest in, in donating. So we have 25 packs and 50 packs, and we are actually um, launching our website with the pre-orders, and we hope to have um, any books purchased to everybody in late November ahead of ISAW, um, which is the Infantile Spasm Awareness Week. So hopefully that will be really great timing. 
That's amazing. Well, we will keep our eyes out for that and just so freaking excited. I am in awe that you are only a year into this epilepsy journey and you are already a ferocious advocate writing a book. And um, Charlotte is so lucky to have you as I'm sure you feel so lucky to have her. Kate, what do you hope that other parents take away from your story? So many things. Um, but if I had to pick one, probably that mom gut is real. You know, you hate to be that pushy, annoying, like worrisome mom. Um, but you know your kids best. And this really opened my eyes to a lot of medical professionals don't know about this. Um, and there is so much more awareness, um, research advocacy, all of the things that are needed. And there are so many families that are reassured. Um, and it, it takes so much longer for them to get a diagnosis. And I think you know your kid best. And if something doesn't feel right, unfortunately, it probably isn't. So um, it's hard to to trust yourself like that and, you know, not be so doubtful of yourself. Um, I'm really happy that we had, we were surrounded with who, who we were to get her, um, the the quick treatment that that we did no one is going to advert advocate for their child like their parents kate thank you so very much for being with us today for sharing your family story charlotte's story and for writing a book so that we can share it with everyone else kate thank you thanks for having me it was great to talk to you Thank you, Kate, for sharing your IS journey with us. As Kate noted, infantile spasms can be a devastating diagnosis to receive. It is a medical emergency. Early identification, diagnosis, and treatment of infantile spasms is vital to achieving the most positive outcome for your child. In 2013, Cure Epilepsy launched its Infantile Spasms Initiative as the first team science approach in the epilepsy research community. Our dedication to infantile spasms research continues today. If you would like more information about infantile spasms, how to identify the signs of IS, and what to do if you suspect your baby is displaying these signs, please visit the Infantile Spasms page of the Cure Epilepsy website at cureepilepsy.org forward slash infantile dash spasms. Cure Epilepsy. Inspiring hope and delivering impact. Thank you. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of Cure Epilepsy. The information contained herein is provided for general information only and does not offer medical advice or recommendations. Individuals should not rely on this information as a substitute for consultations with qualified healthcare professionals who are familiar with individual medical conditions and needs. Cure Epilepsy strongly recommends that care and treatment decisions related to epilepsy and any other medical conditions be made in consultation with a patient's physician or other qualified healthcare professionals who are familiar with the individual's specific health situation.